All right. Welcome to Church in the Wild. My name is Jason. I get to be the pastor here. If I haven't met you, I would love to meet you after the service. Uh, we are closing a series called This Glorious Light, and uh, we've gone through First and Second John, and we are now into Third John. And we said that this series, the way John kind of writes his passages is um, how we would make movies nowadays. So 1 John would be like an overall just big picture. 2 John would be a story within that picture. And if this was uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, 3 John would be focused on Rocket. It would be locked in and lined in like a close-up personal story about one person in particular that he's talking to. And we've kind of gone through this series and said that John has talked about this idea that we need to stop making God into our own image, and instead we need to make ourselves into the image of God. This has been John's theme throughout all of these passages as he's saying, hey, so many of you are deciding, hey, this is who I think God is. This is how my God is. This is how my Jesus would be. This is what my Jesus would say. This is how I think he looks. And he said, instead, we should be focused entirely on saying, how do I make myself into his image. And what image was he? He was light. And in him was no darkness at all. And that was the key line for, for the first book of John was, hey, there's no darkness in him. So he can do all of these different things. And so we've looked at this series and we've said that light heals and light reveals. We said that light wins on Easter. And then we, we talked about how light unites and it guides and it warms and then today we're going to close with this idea that light cleans, light cleans. This is probably not the most spiritual reference you'll ever hear, but my wife and I were watching Down to Earth with Zac Efron. And you can learn from anything, even Zac Efron. And uh, there was an episode where they went and they were talking to this city and the city figured out that it was better for their water system to stop dumping chemicals into the water to clean it. And instead they started shooting it full of light. Because they said light does a better job of cleaning than anything that we can make. So the city of Paris in France is literally cleaning their water by taking light and pouring light into their water as they move it and taking ultraviolet light and shooting that in and so that they can have cleaner water. Third John verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, this is very important because John is going to say in 1 John, walk in the light, walk in the light, walk in the light. He's going to repeat that over and over and over. And he's going to add 40 times that you are beloved. And then he's going to call you little children. And when we arrive at 3 John, all of a sudden he says a word differently. He says, hey, I want you to walk in the truth. And that's interesting. Verse 11 says, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Verse 12, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone, from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. So here you have in 3 John, and in, in, in reality, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, this, this wording that keeps getting brought up. John keeps saying, hey, walk in the light, walk in the light, walk in the light. Then he says, walk in truth, walk in truth, walk in truth. And then he adds in it, do good, imitate good. And all these are denoting action because Christianity is an active faith. But it's really easy to get caught up right there when you see that imitate good, don't, don't imitate evil. It's really easy to jump into, well, if I do something wrong, that must mean that I am not from God. But I want to point out, our activity is not what cleans us up. Jesus, our light, cleans us as we walk in him. It is Jesus' responsibility to clean us up as we walk the longer and more consistently we walk in the light, the more God cleans us up. John gives us 
two examples of this in 3 John. He starts right off the bat. He says, hey, Gaius, I want to talk to you. And like the very first, you know, hey, Gaius, I want to talk to you about church. And I want to talk to you about walking in the truth. And then he ends the chapter by saying, by the way, Demetrius is an evidence of this. Demetrius is this man who's evidence of doing this very thing that we are talking about. And it's really interesting because Demetrius is the reason most of us believe that the church was written, these letter, these churches were in Ephesus because Demetrius used to be a silversmith who worshiped fake gods, false gods, pagan gods, and he used to make idols for them. And then he was gloriously saved. And now we're saying like, oh, he's one of the leaders in the church. But as John almost always does, John says, there's a good, good reference and then a poor reference and then a good reference. And so John gives us one of, one of the evidence of somebody who is not actively walking in truth. Look at first, third John verse nine, third John verse nine. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing. And then look at what he says he's doing. Talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. So in the middle of 3 John, John gives us this evidence of somebody who's not actively walking in truth. And he says, first of all, that he desires leading over learning. This is somebody, if you really think about this, the, the audacity of this man. John is the only living person who has seen the resurrected Jesus at this point in history. John is the only living person who's walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, had Jesus wash his feet, witnessed the miracles, heard the words that Jesus says, and this man Diotrephes is like, yeah, I'm in charge, not you, John. I'll take it from here. And I, honestly, one of the evidences of, of in my life, and in the life I think of our church, and in the life of the American church, is that when we fail to actively walk in truth, we begin to crave leadership over learning. It's almost an automatic default reaction of somebody who's not active in their faith with God that they all of a sudden say, hey, how come I don't get the title you gave them? Hey, how come I have to learn? Hey, I don't want to learn. I don't want to study. And you can, you can watch someone as, as someone I've, I've been, oh, I don't want to tell you how old I'll be, um, but I'll just do it. I'm going to be 40 in July, very old. I know, yeah, woo, all right, over the hill, woo. Still can beat Jesse Parthmore in every workout, though. So, you know, um, <laughs> um, as someone who's been in ministry since birth, like literally my dad planted a church, my brother's a church planter, my, my siblings married church planters, there's an evidence that you see. Someone stops walking with God and almost always there comes this, you know what, I don't need to learn. It's almost an automatic symbol well, this person's struggling in their walk with God. I've seen it in the American church. I've seen it in our church. I've seen it in myself. That when I'm not actively walking with the Lord in the truth, learning becomes a lot harder. And this is what it looks like. I'll go to conferences and think, I don't know why I would need to listen to that person. Uh, they're not my style. They're not going to teach me something. Uh this series about light, when are we going to stop talking about light? I'll wait till the next one. That's like an automatic symbol. It's like a, like a red flashing light that, hey, when you start wanting to lead but not learn, there's a, there's a sign that, boy, there's something not right in your active walk with God. And we said this last week. We said learning always leads to better leading. But leading does not always lead to learning. And this is true. I, I was talking to our staff about this this week. As a pastor, you don't go to church. Never. Like, never do you go to church because you're always obsessing over things. I was, I was talking to Caleb about it. In, in worship, I said, it's so hard to shut my mind off in worship and not be like, man, I should have put that note in the guide. 
I should have put that. Oh, when they all pray together, I should have asked this. Like, it's so difficult. And so you have to force yourself into the attitude of a relentless learner. And I recognize that when my walk with God is not what it should be, I lean a lot more on my title and a lot less on learning. But the second thing is he says that he's talking wicked nonsense, which is a hilarious way of saying he's gossiping and slandering people. He's gossiping. And I think one of the evidences of someone who's not actively walking with God, boy, we love the drama. We love it. We don't only love it, we love spreading the drama. And we love to talk about the drama and talk about the drama and talk about the drama. But a third one is that he's refusing to welcome the brothers. So he's somebody who's not generous. And I think in all of our lives, if we're honest, when we're not actively walking with God, generosity is a lot less hard to come by. Like it's a lot harder to hit the automatic giving on tidely when our walk with God's not what it should be. Because we fail to recognize how desperately we need the generosity of God. And then all of a sudden, the generosity from us to others is like, why would I give you money? Why would I do, why would I be generous? Why would I serve? Why would I be generous with my time? I was talking to someone this week and they said, you know, I really don't want to be in charge of anything. I just want to serve and be generous with the gifts God's given me. That's a sign of somebody actively walking with God. The fourth sign that this is not the case is that he cuts people out. Look at it again. He says, uh, Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, he wants to be in charge, does not acknowledge our authority. He won't learn. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing. He's talking wicked nonsense, which is gossiping and slandering. Not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. So the brothers right here are these, these traveling speakers. They're traveling church to church and trying to help the church. And he's like, no, not you. We're not giving you a penny. And then stops those who want to be generous and kicks them out of his church. And so we see this, these signs of somebody in the middle of 3 John who's not actively walking. His, his walk with God has stopped, and he's somebody who's now not walking in truth, and instead he's saying, I'll tell you how things should go, and here's how I think they should go. We should not be generous. We should not. And he does all these things. And this is the very interesting part of 3 John, because it's kind of negative. <laughs> like when you read 3 John, you're like, oh man, well, that's a slap in the face. I'm guilty of all of those things. And I, honestly, we are all guilty of all of those things at different times. And that's kind of the point of 3 John. See, John is pointing out the evidence of somebody who is not consistently walking in truth. And this is because he wants us to see the need to walk in the light. Look in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he's saying, hey, if, if, if your heart is convicted of any of these things, if you're struggling with your walk with God, and so, man, you're being convicted, you're, these things are hurting, these things are like, oh, I need to improve in that. He says, listen, don't forget you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is pure light. Then look at uh, 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So again, John is like, hey, I know you're struggling with things. I don't want you to forget. You're God's children and he's with you and you can overcome this battle. And then in 3 John, or 1 John 3, 19, by this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. This is so interesting to me. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. <laughs> so it's a little bit like saying, hey, if you're feeling guilty about cutting people out of your life, remember God knows every detail about that. But God is greater than our heart. And if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Here's, here's what John is saying. Anytime you start to feel God prick your heart and say, hey, you need to step up in this area. It's a sign that God is trying to clean up your life. 
take confidence in it. Because it's far worse to never have conviction of anything and just walk through life thinking, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm not going to read the scriptures because I don't want to know anything else, so I'm good. And when the preacher talks, I'm going to think like, yep, them seven other people, they need this. But when our heart begins to say, boy, you're falling short in that, that's a sign that God is trying to work in your heart. This is why we have to preach about certain sins at certain times, because we all need to be reminded regularly that walking with God cleans us up as we go. When we are convicted of things, it is evidence that God is cleaning us. Conviction shows us that he's working on us, and to not have that shows we're not really walking actively in truth. So now we get to this point of like, okay, cool. What do you mean walk in truth? What does that actually mean? Like, do I need to walk so many miles a day and like chant a prayer as I go do I need to get a treadmill and like put a Bible in front of my face? No, that's how you end up on YouTube, by falling and getting hurt, right? That's not, the, that's not what we're talking about. John, who writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, learns from Jesus what it is that he's talking about here. Look at John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Look at it again. Verse three, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. It's right in the middle of John that he shows us what he's talking about. Abide in me and I in you as the branches cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So now we've got to try to figure out, okay, so walking in the light means also walking in the truth, which also means abiding, and I still don't know what you're talking about, Jason, so what does it mean? The word abide means remain in daily relationship with and depend upon. It's not a very complex idea. It means, I'm going to blow your mind theologically. It's going to be the biggest thing you've ever heard, walking daily with Jesus. We've heard it in a lot of different ways, but rather than attempting to clean ourselves up, we walk in his light daily and he cleans us up. So when you're saved, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you're saved in a process of three things. You're saved through this thing called justification. Justification is when you cry out to Jesus and are like, I need to give you my life because I am a hot mess and I cannot save myself and I cannot justify myself and my life is a train wreck and God, I need you because if this life's a train wreck, what's eternity even going to look like? When Jesus steps in and says, hey, I died on the cross and so I justify you in front of God the Father. I make you clean. When you step into the presence of the Father after this life is over, you then go through something called glorification. I am particularly excited about this one because I'm about to be 40, and now every donut I eat is equivalent to 10, and every mile I run feels like 10. And my, like I woke up this week on Friday, and uh, my wife was like, what was that noise? And I was like, that was my entire body cracking. Like my toes cracked for the first, just like I got out of bed feeling like a transformer, just making all these noise. Like, well, I need oil. I need some kind of oil. I don't know about getting anointed in oil, but I just need to take a bath in it because I am so old. I'm falling apart. You get a glorified body when you step into the presence of the Father. God justifies your soul. and When you step into the presence of the Father, he glorifies your body. I won't have the brain damage that I suffered from strokes in my past. I won't have the heart issue that I have. I won't have the bad knees and the creaky hips and the the pain. We won't have the, the blindness. We won't have the struggles. We won't have the diseases. We won't have all of those things. They're gone. They're removed. The pain, the suffering, the sickness is gone. But there's this part in between justification and glorification that's not as much fun. And it's this word called sanctification. And sanctification is the messy middle. It's in between the two where God daily cleans us up over time. 
where our walk with God reveals to us a need in an area. And God begins to say, boy, you sure you want to pray with that mouth? You sure you want to say those things? Like you don't have to come to Jesus clean, but he begins to clean you as you live through life. You sure you want to say those words to your spouse? Sure about you sure you want to call your kid that name? You sure you want to say that to your coworker? You sure you want to lie about why you're late? Everyone already knows it was Starbucks anyways, not the traffic. We all know, so maybe you shouldn't lie. Jesus begins to clean us up. You sure you want to tell that rumor? You don't really know if that's true. You sure you want to say that? You sure you want to be offended over that thing that you, you probably really shouldn't be offended over, but you sure you want to? Get? That's what Jesus begins to do as we walk in his truth. Over time, he begins to reveal issues to us that we never saw in ourselves. And John is reminding us, that's not bad, that's good. That's a reminder that he's working in us and he's helping us and he's growing us and he's pruning things out of our life so that we can bear more fruit. John's example of what we might view as bad is actually something that's encouraging because he's saying to us, hey, there is something going on in your life. I am actively at work cleaning you up. And I don't know about you, but I thought that there would become a point where I just started to get more saintly and I like would be fine. You know, like, yeah, you just hit like 33. It's the year of Jesus. And then all of a sudden you're like, I never swear. I never, you know, like I just thought that would happen. I never spend money on something I shouldn't. That didn't happen. And now I'm actually more convicted of my sins that as I go longer. Like, boy, you should not talk to your wife that way. Things that I would have thought were fine 15 years ago, I'm suddenly aware of, is that way of thinking about that person really how I would think about them? God saves us, then he glorifies us someday in the future, but in the process, he cleans us through the light of Jesus. John Mark Comer said this, spiritual discipline does not change us, it makes room in our heart for God to change us by silencing our own voices. Walking in truth, walking in the light is something, if you grew up in Bible school, if you grew up in Sunday school, if you grew up in whatever, power, our power, whatever they called it, all the different names that the 80s, 90s Christians came up with where God was like, I don't know what you're all doing, but that's fine, <laughs> right? Reading the Bible and praying sounds so simple that we just as Christians are like, nah. And yet, as we spend time daily, consistently with God, it is what he uses to clean us up. The more consistently we walk in the light, the more he cleans us. So here's the challenge as we close out this series. I don't know where you are in your walk with God. For some, your walk with God is limited to listening to me preach on Sunday mornings. And maybe you might subscribe to us on Spotify. Perhaps you might subscribe to us on YouTube. And maybe you might read the emails I try to send out, but I'll often fail to. Perhaps that's your walk with God. I am not condemning you at all. I am super glad that that's what you choose to do. But I would also encourage you to then take it up a step. And there's a couple ways to do that. One, uh, I use something called Uversion Bible Plan. It's not complex. It's not difficult. I have, I'm on there. I'm happy to be friends with you. I like to share Bible studies and do them together with people. And it's like, man, uh, we just finished one, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And in it, it's like five days long. There's probably 10... 10 total paragraphs in all the devotional. And then there's also like some verses and then there's where you put your thoughts and I put our thought, my thoughts and we just kind of share them together. That's a great first step. Now, some of you like, man, I do that every day, Jason. You're not challenging me. Then I would say, hey, I would start to study more and I would start to look more. Um, this entire series I can make available to you like as a download and you can have it for free. 
You can just read the entire sermon series. I'll try to cut out the randomness in my notes. That's only for me because my brain works like spaghetti sometimes. But I can make that available to you. For those who are like, I don't need that. I already got this. Great. Let's all consistently as a church body walk closer and closer and closer together. And I know you've heard this since you were children, but so have I. And yet I often find myself not doing it. And every time I find myself not doing it, I find myself more obsessed with leading than learning. I find out it's really hard to be generous. I find out that I'm not as willing to extend grace to others who do something. And I'm like, oh, they meant that on purpose. And it is the craziest thing. When I'm consistent in my Bible study, I am like impossible to offend. But when I'm not, you just mentioned the Detroit Lions and I'm upset. Like the NFL draft last week. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, it's so difficult when I'm not actively walking with God. So God is actively cleaning us. We do not have to clean ourselves. We just need to walk with him to consistently. So start today. One step is better than no steps. John's gospel should encourage us to stay consistently walking, not get discouraged by failures, temptations, and convictions, and to keep on walking in the truth. Because as we do, God begins to clean us and convict us and to grow us and to sharpen us. And then we begin to bear more fruit for him. This is the theme of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, to make ourselves into the image of God and not make him into our image. So I'm going to ask you all to stand to your feet right now. We've done this for a couple of weeks. So those of you who are used to doing this, I'm going to ask you to step and lead the way. Over the last couple of weeks, we've started praying together. And I'm going to come down front and I'm happy to pray with you. I'm happy to pray over any issue, every thought, anything like, hey, I'm happy to just discuss how to get started studying the Bible. But I also think that a church that prays together stays together. And I think that we need to begin to encourage each other. So I wrote some notes for you in your worship guide. If you're new to this idea of praying, it can be really challenging. So today at the bottom of the, the second page, it says, what is something that you love about God? And what I'm going to ask you to do is in just a minute, find someone near you. If you are been here for a while, don't make the new person find you, please. Find them. Ask them, hey, what's something you love about God? Then ask them, how is God guiding you? And then how can I pray for you? And then I'm going to encourage you all to spend a little bit of time praying together. These guys are going to come up here. They're going to sing. They're going to worship. They're going to do their thing. I'm going to be down front. I'm going to give you the opportunity to pray together. And then I'll come up and I'll pray over all of us together. Then we'll do a video and then we'll close. But let me challenge you with this thought. When we fail to lose sight of walking with him actively, it can be a challenge, right? It can be, well, I'm so busy. I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. But when we remember how generous God is to us with salvation, with grace, so much so that he saves us, and that could be enough, but he chooses to glorify us, which is awesome. And that could be enough but he also chooses to help us throughout our daily life that's in that messy middle. He sanctifies us and cleans us up because he is light and in him is no darkness at all. So I'm gonna encourage you right now, find someone near you, grab onto someone, take your family, grab your family and pray with somebody else's family. If you don't, if you need help, read the guides. If you don't need help and you're like, Jay, I got this, I don't need this, man, awesome, good for you. But we're going to worship up here. You guys are going to pray, and then I'll come up, and I'll pray at the end.